All right, welcome everybody. If someone can just put in the chat a yes that you can hear me, I would much appreciate that. Excellent, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you all. Well, welcome to this Thursday, beautiful day, snowing in most of our Northeastern area. Um, welcome, first of all, thank you for your time and joining us. My name is Jessica Moore. I'm a health and wellness consultant here at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, I'm so excited to welcome you to our year-long symposium um, focusing on helping Vermont's community thrive. The symposium is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's Caring for Our Children Foundation. And today's discussion is in partnership with Come Alive Outside, um, super important partner in helping everyone embrace the outdoors. And that's what we'll be partnering today with on talking about exploring the outdoors and overcoming any barriers um, that we may have to getting outside into nature. Before getting started, I just wanna give you a few tips on using Zoom. I'm sure this is not our first time doing so, but just so you know, all participants are muted upon entry. We ask that you stay muted throughout the presentation just so our speakers can have clarity but we really want your um, feedback and your conversation. So use that chat box. You can find it usually at the bottom of your screen if it's not already open. If it's open, it will be to your right. So please chat, create conversation, create connections. Um, any questions that are not addressed during this um, conversation, the great Arwen will follow up and we'll make sure to touch base with any questions that we cannot address today. Finally, the best viewing option if you are on a desktop tends to be the speaker view, so you can see the presentation and the speaker. And then finally, if you would like audio transcription, that option is available and you can turn it on again. The bottom panel of your screen will have that enable audio transcription if you want that option. So finally, to tell you more about our um, today's symposium, I would like to introduce to you Catherine Hamilton. Catherine is the Vice President of Consumer Services and Planning at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, and she serves as the President um, for the Caring for Our Children Foundation. Catherine is a wellness leader here at our organization and in the community as a fabulous yoga instructor. Uh, she imagined the Caring for Our Kids series as an extension of our organization's commitment to lifelong well being for all Vermonters. So, welcome, Catherine, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Jess, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. If you could advance to the next slide, please. I just wanted to say a few words of introduction. Um, the Vermont Caring for Children Foundation's goal is to advance and improve the health of all Vermonters, particularly children. Next slide. So these symposia were really imagined as a way of bringing light at what is a pretty dark time for many of us. Um, so our goal today is to provide information to the employers that we serve. Our many customers are here today. Also um, to our members and consumers um, to really share best practices that inspire us, that bring us light. To quote the amazing Amanda Wilson from her poem yesterday, um, for there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. And when we think about um, getting outside and moving our bodies, um, we have a culture um, that really related to exercise that I re refer to as the illusion of no excuses. And for many of us, um, just doing it can be more complicated um, than it might seem. And our panelists today really understand the obstacles and barriers to exercise, but they are also shining examples of leaders who are successfully helping Vermonters to overcome these um, in all sorts of ways. And so it, it is such an honor to be offering insights and guidance from the leaders on our panel, Myrna Valeria, Valerio, the Myrnavator, Norm Staunton from Vermont Adaptive and Myra Peffer the, from Come Alive Outside. They represent and embody to me the courage and the confidence and the character. Uh, that we are trying to promote through these series. Um, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, I also wanted to do a plug for our incredible team at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, Jess Moore and Rich Lewis and Emily Crosby, and in particular, Megan Peake for all the programs that, that she provides our community. 
Um, she is a, an incredible leader herself and has developed some programs called Wellness Revolution, a biking program for women, a velocity program for young adult men, and a series of free signature events that many of you may be familiar with. And she has adapted these programs creatively this year for the circumstances that we're in to offer them safely and virtually. So a big plug for our virtual snow days, our first offering, and there's a huge um, package of winter gear available for those who enter the contest. So I will be joining you virtually for the, for the snow days this year. Um, and next I'd like to introduce our facilitator, if you advance to the next slide, Arwen Turner. And um, Arwen is part of an organization she leads, Come Alive Outside, which is inspiring collaborative community systems that create awareness, intention, and opportunity for people to live healthier lives outside. And it is my honor to introduce Arwen, um, who will lead us through today's session. We cannot hear you, Arwen, so I'm gonna ask you to unmute, unmute myself. All right, can you hear me now? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. And uh, Jess, as I start talking, do you see if you can, someone did some artistic expression on the, uh, the board? If you're able to somehow get rid of that, that would be great. I but thank you, Catherine, best. for such a warm welcome. And I just wanted to thank everyone for having come alive outside today to discuss the barriers that exist for youth and their families to connect with the outdoors and uh, why getting outdoors is so important right now for health and wellness. So a little bit about come alive outside. We work with communities to connect folks back to nature for increased health and wellness. And we have programs for school age children, adults and work sites, folks referred to us by clinicians, and starting last week, we began providing programs to the substance use recovery community here in Rutland, Vermont. Our organization and our programs are based off the simple fact that nature is good medicine. And by being active and connected to the outdoors and nature that communities can achieve improved mental and physical health and quality of life. And today we're gonna to be talking about the benefits and barriers of connecting to nature specifically for youth. But before we dive into the barriers of getting outdoors, I wanted to go a little bit over the why and why getting outdoors is so important right now. Currently, only 24% of children meet the national aerobic physical requirements. The benefits of physical activity has been widely documented to improve the mind and body. A regular habit of being active can help prevent high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, and diseases such as heart disease and diabetes. Physical activity also reduces stress, anxiety, and provides a general feeling of well-being. We're seeing that there's a direct correlation between the amount of time children spend outdoors and how much physical activity they're getting. In fact, children today spend half as much time outdoors as children did in 1980. As the nation's population falls short of meeting basic physical activity requirements, it simultaneously experienced what Richard Louv termed nature deficit disorder. And he, he coined this phrase in his book, uh, Last Child in the Woods, which I highly recommend everyone read and we can send out in the notes. Over the last decade, research has documented that children are spending less time outside than previous generations. And this term, nature deficit disorder, puts a name to the range of human costs associated with isolation from nature. The reason for this trend are many. Children have less instructor playtime, increased fear of the perceived risks of spending time outside, as well as ever more engaging electronic devices to capture kids' attention. The health and cognitive implications of nature deficit disorder range from increasing levels of health problems in children to increased attention deficit disorder. And currently we're seeing that kids are spending more than seven hours of screen time a day. The negative impacts of the separation of people from nature are compounded by this increase in screen time for both children and adults. It has been shown that limited use of high quality and developmentally appropriate media have positive influences, but excessive exposure of screen time at all ages is associated with development and health concerns. These include 
brain development issues in young children to sleep problems, behavior problems, depression, and in increased high risk behavior at early ages. Increased depressive symptoms among teens are also directly linked to social media use. We are just beginning to experience the cost of chronic diseases linked to these lifestyles. And unless effective interventions are employed, we can only expect these costs to increase as the current generation of young people age into adulthood. And this was all before the pandemic. Currently amid social distancing, children are presenting above normal symptoms of anxiety and depression. And lifestyles amid COVID are becoming more sedentary, which is having even more negative impacts on physical and mental health. This can all feel pretty grim, uh, but the great thing is that we do have a solution to these problems. And the solution is affordable, easy to find, and everyone can participate in it. It's good old mother nature. And I've included some pictures here of some of our program participants from Come Alive Outside. And I wanted to share a couple stories about some of these folks. So if you see on the bottom left, there's a little girl with a water bottle and some mittens and a hat. This is Renee. Renee uh, self-proclaimed herself as the official park inspector of Rutland County in 2019, when she and her grandma Joan participated in our summer passport program for kids. And at this time, Renee's mom uh, was undergoing treatment for cancer. And so Grandma Joan and Renee every single day would meet up. Um, it was kind of a, it was very much a stressful situation at home. And they would do every single activity in the summer passport. And what we heard from uh, Joan was that not only did this help Joan get active with her granddaughter and create a much stronger bond, but the memories that they have that summer are not memories of being stressed all the time of worrying all the time. I mean, these were things, there were definitely stuff going on in their lives that was really stressful and, and not the best of times, but because they were outdoors and connected so much together, they have really positive memories of a time that could otherwise be looked at as a really, really scary time in their life. Another story I have is up on the right, you see two little boys. These are uh, Gaspar and Giuliano. They live in Bennington, Vermont. And this last summer, they were our biggest fans of our summer passport because it became a way to keep them active outdoors while social distancing. And uh, their mom, Lisette, took a picture of every single activity that they did and sent it to us. And what she told us was like, not only was this a way for them to keep active and have a goal for them to do every single day, but it really helped these two brothers learn to work better together by building these uh, activities nature-based activities, while taking walks together, by looking for things in parks together. They bonded so quickly when, because their ages were so similar, they tended not to get along a lot when they were playing with screens and fighting over toys and things like that, which is a really positive experience. And we'd love to hear some about your positive experiences and memories of the outdoors as a child. So if you could type into the comments right now, a positive memory you have of being connected to nature as youth, we'll share some of these aloud. So just go ahead and start typing. And I'm gonna tell you one of my positive experience as a youth uh, growing up while we get some good answers in there. And then I'll have Jess read some of these off. Uh, so I was raised in rural Northern California. I was definitely raised as a free range child in the eighties playing outdoors alone until it was time uh, to come in. And how we knew it was time to come in was that either my mom would yell our names or it got dark. Um, I fancied myself a writer at a young age. And from the time I was seven to 17, I would take a journal or a diary and sit under my favorite tree outside and write the cheesiest poems about whatever dramatic thing had happened to me in my life. And, you know, looking back on that, you know, it, I always felt so good after that, no matter how awful the day had been, however hormonal and adolescent issues I was having, just that experience of just having that daily ritual connected to nature, it just made me feel happier. So that's one of my favorite memories of, of being connected to the outdoors. And Jess, what do we have from the, the peanut gallery out there? 
Uh, there's so many good ones. <laughs> and I'll just read through a few, but please keep typing because this is really, I think that these memories make us think of that positive connection and that desire to get back out if we're a little removed from nature right now. But shooting stars at a sleepaway camp when I was eight. Oh. Shorts in the woods. <laughs> this is even better. Building sketchy tree houses <laughs> with my siblings in the woods. <laughs> Walking stream, um, streams, looking for salamanders and frogs, streams in the woods, building forts, camping and swimming, ice skating at the pond, more forts, collecting salamanders and making forts, sledding trails in the woods, going off into the woods near a stream all day and pretending we live there. Always being at the summer pool, surrounded with friends, being bioluminance for the first time in the ocean, Felt like pure magic. Looking for it's outside, nighttime snowshoeing, every day in the ocean at the Jersey Shore. Love the Jersey Shore. <laughs> also unsupervised. I feel a lot of these comments are all about <laughs> freedom. Sledding on Casey's Hill with my cousins in Underhill. Tent camping year round, even in February. Skipping rocks. Awesome. I mean, I, oh, I'll do I'm one sorry. more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Riding my bike around the neighborhood to get to friends, baseball parks, and to the beach. It was freedom. And I'll stop there, but please keep reading through all these amazing comments. And keep, feel free to keep typing them in. I think it's always yeah. nice to see what's happening in the chat during these. So keep on typing those memories and any questions or thoughts that come up. But, you know, it's just even hearing those, it's like you're taken back to the spot in your your mind and your feelings and remembering what it was like to be young and remember the outdoors experience and we have to remember that not all kids are having these same experiences anymore that that we might have had especially those of us who are raised in in kind of a a different time um where there was a lot more unstructured play i think those times before the 2000s when when uh we all had access to the internet everywhere um but you know what's amazing to think is that there's more than just nostalgia to these memories. There were things happening in our mind and bodies while we are spending time in nature. I'm gonna go over just the science of, of why nature experiences are so important when we're thinking about physical and mental well being for children. So, children who spend more time outdoors after school get more to moderate vigorous physical activity. Movement enhances and promotes the development of motor skills, bones and muscles, cognitive and social skills. We also know that nature experiences, including walking, relieve anxiety and negative effects of stress and are associated with greater emotional well being in children. In fact, for adults and children, there's a strong connection between time spent in nature and reduced negative emotions. This includes symptoms of anxiety, depression, and psychosomatic illnesses like irritability, insomnia, tension headaches, and indigestion. Stress is relieved within minutes of exposure to nature as measured by muscle tension, blood pressure, and brain activity. And time in green spaces significantly reduces your cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Nature also boosts endorphin levels and dopamine produ uh, production, which promotes happiness. Learning in natural environments can enhance creativity, critical thinking, concentration, and problem solving in children. And being nearby to nature has been shown to reduce symptoms of ADHD. Limiting screen time for kids reduces exposure to media violence, which in turn leads to benefits such as improved sleep, better school performance, improved social behavior, and reduced aggression. The sensory overload of screen time causes kids to have poor focus and depletes their mental energy, which often leads to anger and explosive behavior. And I think it's good to point out that although many parents think that their children are using screens for mainly educational purposes, studies show that as children enter into adolescence, that this is really not the case and that screen time overcome becomes less and less educational. A common suggestion for screen time meltdown is to take a child for a walk or go outdoors to calm them down. But what if it was reversed? What if getting outdoors wasn't used as a tool to help counteract screen time meltdown, but rather the dominant activity in your child's life? Spending time in nature can also improve young people's confidence. 
A study found that 79% of children felt more confident in themselves having spent time participating in act outdoor activities. And also after participating in outdoor activities, 84% of children said that they were capable of doing new things when tried. And finally, nature has a myriad of mental and physical health benefits for a child. But what happens when a family unit gets together and starts going outdoors more often? A recent study showed that by having mother and daughters take an outdoor walk together, that the pair showed greater cohesion, closeness, sense of unity, and ability to get along. Although the study was done with a mother and daughter, the research makes a really strong case that spending time in nature can affect all family relationships. And we all know that the added stress on our lives when our family units are not getting along. It's such a beautiful notion to think that by connecting to nature together, that that can connect us stronger with our family units, and then therefore decrease some of the stress that makes us feel less connected to the people in our, our lives. So now that we've explored some of the science behind the benefits of nature and the importance of getting youth outdoors right now, I am so excited that we are now gonna hear from our panel of experts about the barriers and opportunities for youth engagement outdoors. So bear with me by I stop sharing my screen and we can look at everyone on here. Okay, Jess, are you able to highlight our speakers? I am doing it now. <laughs> All right, right. Myrna, Myra, and Norm, and you, Arlen, are all spotlighted. Wonderful. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists today. What I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna go through and do a bio of each. And after I do your bio, feel free to say hello to the crowd panelists. And then we're going to uh, start asking some questions. So our first panelist is Myra Peffer. Myra Peffer is a program director of Come Alive Outside. Myra is the founder and former executive director of Wonderfeet Kids Museum in Rutland, Vermont. Myra has a BS in biology and a, a BA master's of education. Myra has over 30 years of experience in education program and exhibit development and implementation, fundraising, nonprofit management, and her experience in working in different <laughs> settings of informal education have given Myra a unique and multifaceted approach to program design and delivery. Myra, if you could say hello to everyone. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to meet you today. So happy to have you. Our next panelist is Norm Staunton. Before becoming a full-time staff member, Norm was a coach, volunteer, and trainer for Vermont Adaptive since 2008 and was the contractor for the organization's capital campaign beginning in 2014. Previously, Norm spent 20 years in a variety of nonprofit and adventure industry executive positions around Vermont and the world. He attended the master's program in outdoor education at the University of New Hampshire, where he focused his research on adventure with people with disabilities. He holds a master's in business administration from the University of Vermont, where he focused on sustainability and nonprofit management. In his spare time, Norm is an avid skier, sailor, surfer, paddler, fisherman, and outdoor instructor. He makes his home in South Burlington, where he lives with his partner, Jen, and their two labs, Rudder and Tugboat, and spends as much time on the lakes, waterways, coast, and in the mountains as he can. Originally from Rhode Island, he now considers Vermont his home and Southport, Maine to be his home away from home. And Norm is a member of the PSIA AASI Eastern Division Adaptive Development Team and holds instructor certification in skiing, telemark, paddling, surfing, and sailing. Welcome Norm Staunton from Vermont Adaptive. Good morning, everybody. That sounded like a long bio. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, you've done so many amazing things. <laughs> I hope it, I think it was a great bio. Um, and finally, uh, we have Myrna Valerio. Myrna Valerio is a native of Brooklyn, New York, a former educator and cross country coach, ultra marathon and author of the Amazon best-selling memoir, A Beautiful Work in Progress. Although she began running in high school, she recommitted to the sport after a health scare in 2008 and started her blog, Fat Girl Running, about her experiences as a larger woman in a world of thinner endurance athletes while training for her first marathon. Myrna's athletic story has been featured in 
the WSJ, Runner's World on NBC, Nightly News, CNN, in the viral REI-produced documentary short, The Murnivator. Her writing has been featured in Women's Running Magazine, Self Magazine Online, Outside Online, and Runner Worlds Magazine. In 2008, she was chosen as National Geographic Adventure of the Year and most recently appeared on the Kelly Clarkson Show at Access Daily. She currently lives and trains in Vermont, USA. Myrna is also known as the Myrnavator. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> All right. Well, before we have our panelists dig into some of the questions we prepared for them, we wanted to pull this group about the barriers you recognize that exist for youth connecting to the outdoors. So Jess is gonna pop up a poll for you all to answer. And Jess, is this a, you can answer one or you can answer as many as you feel? I'm pretty sure it's check boxes. So okay. fingers crossed when you do it, I believe you can choose multiple. Let's okay. <laughs> roll. All right, and the prompt is, what barriers do you feel are our greatest challenges to helping youth access the health and wellness benefits of the outdoors? And the poll is up, so you can yep. see some of those options there. So just start clicking on them, whatever, you know, read them. And while you're answering this poll, just some housekeeping notes on this panel. Please type in the questions that you have for our panelists throughout the discussion. If there's barriers that are brought up that we don't have someone on the panel to fully knowledgeably answer the question, we'll definitely either send out some follow-up resources or we're also very happy to have a follow-up discussion where we dig in deeper and have um, individuals who can speak more comprehensively to specific barriers and questions that might come up that we don't have specific experience with. This is great. And just so you know, Arwen, people are still answering. So we'll just give it a few more seconds. Okay. Great. All right, looks like it's slowing down. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Let's share those results. Can you see okay. them, Arlen? Yep, I can see them. So it looks like affordability came up as high numbers, transportation and access, access for people with disabilities, feeling them welcome, unrepresented, unsafe, family support. So, you know, we had um, you know, answers on all of these, which is great, because these are all the things that we're addressing today. Um, but, you know, it's good for us to see and kind of measure where you're all coming from with what you recognize as, as some of the barriers. So I think without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and have our panelists start answering some questions. So Myra, can you start off and uh, talk about why this topic is important to you? Got to remember to unmute first, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I grew up in a single parent income challenged home. So my mom worked long hours and we didn't go camping or hiking or anything like that. However, we played outside a lot. I mean, at morning till dark. And there were no computers when I was growing up and the TV had three channels. So there wasn't the, you know, incentive to stay inside. So we spent most of our time outside. I loved myself exploring whatever woodland was close by, but I didn't discover hiking until college. And so it's important to me to help families learn what outdoor activities are available to them because I really didn't know until I was, you know, a young adult. I want families to discover the benefits of the outdoors and how that regular outdoor activity reduces and provides a positive impact, especially on mental well-being. Thank you, Myra. And Norm, same question. Why is this topic meaningful or important to you? I mean, I, I think that for me, there's sort of a, a two-sided answer. Part of it is very personal in that most of my really good early memories involve being outdoors. And I, I realized at a really early age that that was important to me and influential to me. Um, it dictated much of my interest in school. It dictated much of my interest in social activities. Um, and, and so it's just something that, that always resonated with me. I've always felt very fortunate to have had the kind of access to outdoor worlds, um, that I had as, as a kid and as a young adult and now throughout my career. I think the other piece that's really important for me is that 
is particularly here in Vermont, there is a, there's a cultural element to all of this for us, that much of the culture of Vermont, much of how we socialize, much of how we define our communities is around outdoor sport. They're around outdoor recreation. And so we can talk about these barriers and we can talk about providing access in, in the sort of physical sense, in the sort of participatory sense, but it's really that sort of social inclusion that becomes the, the outcome that we're looking for. And that's, that's really the important part for me is giving, giving folks the access to the, the culture and the community that is Vermont and the place that we've all chosen to be. Thank you. I think social inclusion is so important. And I, I think we probably do a whole entire call on just that. Um, but yeah, let's definitely, you know, I think elaborate on that throughout these questions. Uh, and Myrna, what about you? Why is this topic meaningful, important to you? Sure. Um, first, I wanted to say that the whole issue of social inclusion is a real thing. I know that as soon as I moved here, people started asking me, well, how did you get outside today? And uh, I think that's an incredible way to start a conversation or to greet somebody. Hey, Myrna, how did you get outside today? Um, so yeah, it's a real thing. Uh, and I'd love to explore that more. Um, so, I, so I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and a lot of people, when they think of Brooklyn, they don't think of Brooklyn as a place with a lot of green spaces, when in fact, we have a very vibrant parks and recreation department um, and, uh, I grew up going to neighborhood parks, going to our public pools, um, you know, hanging out in our neighborhood, just, you know, being pushed out the door in the morning, going to free lunch <laughs> and free breakfast at the public schools, and then not being allowed inside unless we had to pee or <laughs> unless it was time to eat, right? Um, when we weren't eating free lunches. So, um, and, and our neighborhood was poor and working class. So, um, so there were opportunities available to us in the 80s. I grew up in the 80s. And um, yeah, and so I, I grew up with this, this constant uh, sort of outdoor experience, outdoor persona. It wasn't your traditional, if you think of the great American outdoors, outdoors, but we were outside all the time, all the time. And, um, and, and from then I really, grew to appreciate any time that I spent outside. And so, you know, when we're talking about knocking down barriers, um, destroying them, I'd like to destroy them. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's important to me because I want other people to experience the same joy, the same awe. I talk about all that when I speak about, um, you know, recreating the outdoors. I want other people to experience that and also to, to reap the benefits from, from recreating outside. Uh, you know, all those, the things that uh, you mentioned, Arwen, um, you know, from, you know, those social skills, motor skills. I, I'm also an educator. So uh, all of those things are really, really important to me. And I, I, I want people to be able to move their bodies outside um, the way in the ways that we were meant to move, the ways that our bodies were designed to move. Um, I can go on and on, but I'm going to let somebody else speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what we can do is we can just roll into the next question and let you start with it, Myrna. Like what barriers do you think are there for why aren't youth being able to embrace the outdoors to get their bodies moving out there? Right, um, I mean, I think one of the primary uh, barriers is financial. Uh, maybe uh, your idea of outdoors means that you think you need to go to a national park or you need to travel somewhere uh, far away to, to get to the outdoors. And so you think, oh, well, I don't have money to do that. I don't have money for the permits. I don't have money. I don't have a reliable car. Maybe you are in an urban uh, environment and you don't have a car because that's not a thing, New York City, you know? Um, so we had to stay very local, but uh, you know, maybe the gear is, well, not maybe, the gear is very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can get recycled or reused gear or, or um, used gear, um, but a lot of people don't have access to that knowledge as far as where that gear is and how do I, how do I get it? Um, and how much is it going to cost me? Um, sometimes you have a family culture that does not include recreating in the outdoors. Um, and so studies show there, there were a couple of studies. One of, one of them is out of um, Sacramento State where they identified a couple of things why, why people of color, specifically black people, um, don't necessarily recreate in wooded areas um, because it's not 
something that we've done in our culture for many reasons. Um, the, the traumatic collective memory um, uh, of lynching and, and uh, perceived racism and all that stuff. So they don't do it. And so their kids don't get exposed. And we know that when kids are exposed to uh, the outdoors early on, they typically will engage in outdoor activities as adults. And so when it's not part of your culture as a young child, you probably won't uh, do that those activities as an adult. Um, and I think also a barrier is this culture of not being outside in schools. Like we've, a lot of schools have done away with outdoor recess. And so when that's not part of your, your routine, when it's not part of your lifestyle as a child, uh, you know, we used to go out and we used to um, hang out in the yard in the morning and then we had lunch and then we had recess and we, um, and then we had PE and, and a lot of times, even in Brooklyn in the wintertime, we were outside in our schoolyards. And so when that's, again, that's not a part of your culture. It's not something you, you will um, do as an adult. Obviously that's not everybody. Um, and, you know, they're, they're perceived fears about, uh, Aaron, I think you mentioned this, um, about being in the outdoors because there's a lack of knowledge, there are lack, there's a lack of skills. Um, I know that a lot of people in my community are, um, you know, afraid of animals or, um, and, or they will say, I, I get a lot of project, a projection about, be careful. Wow, you know, you're gonna hurt yourself. Um, and so that is something that, that keeps people home. You know, you're gonna break your ankle. I don't wanna break my ankle. Um, you know, when, when, and they don't realize that, you know, actually going outside and doing those actions make, makes your body stronger. Right? Um, so so I, I think, um, and also like the other thing that I wanna say is that one of the barriers is like having this notion of the outdoors only being one thing, right? Um, well, I don't do the outdoors cause I don't do Everest. <laughs> I don't kayak. I don't, uh, I don't go hiking so that I'm not an outdoors person, right? And so we have this very, very limited perception of what the outdoors is. And, um, you know, once we broaden that to include, you know, the farming community, perhaps, people who work outside, um, have outdoor skills, people who are migrant farm workers, perhaps, or, or who have migrant farm workers in their families, those are all outdoor experiences. And so when people don't acknowledge those, then it well, then I'm not an outdoors person, so I'm not going to participate in this. So uh, those are the a couple of barriers. There are many, many more, but um, those are the ones that I have come across um, in my own work and in my own experience. Thank you. And I think it's so important to talk about like this, like what does it mean to be an outdoors person? Because some somewhere, and I'm sure that this is because of marketing and media, right? Because that's what tells us who, who is part of something and who isn't part of something. But, you know, a lot of us mentioned how much we spent outdoors growing up, but we might not identify ourselves as an outdoorsy person. And that's just a very strange juxtaposition there of why we're not feeling like we're part of this when, you know, we spent most of our childhood outdoors. And so I think, you know, as we're looking at, you know, underrepresentation and social inclusion, I think those are things we can elaborate on you know, in, in this conversation. I'd love to hear um, from Myra about some of the barriers that you experience in your work for youth getting outdoors. Well, I, I have to agree with everything that Myrna said because, you know, you covered uh, all the aspects that really are important. I think that for Come Alive Outside, we do a lot of different kinds of programs for uh, kids and families. Um, but, you know, being based in Rutland, you know, there's Pico and Killington, you can go skiing, but you know, do you have the money? Do you have the equipment? And I know many schools do have some programs and they, you know, help kids to, you know, get up there and experience that, but that's, that's just out of a lot of people's price range, you know, and then there's the whole biking, you know, I didn't, I went to go buy a bike, you know, I've had bikes over the years and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if I can afford a bike that, you know, that would, I could ride, you know, and it was scary to me to think And here, you know, I work and have a good job and my husband does, but, you know, growing up, our bikes were just used things that, you know, my parents found here and there. So that is another, you know, you have this great system of riding bikes around Vermont, but, you know, can you afford to have a good bike that is, you know, fit for that kind of a trail? And I think just what I talked about in the beginning is just knowing 
what's out there. You know, like, like you and I grew up, I grew up in a lot of different suburbs. So it was always just, you know, whatever neighborhood, you know, you were outside in, but I didn't know about all the other outdoor opportunities. I knew I loved to be outside. I mean, I ended up majoring in biology. I love, and I, you know, I wanted to catch the frog. I wanted to examine the bug, you know, but I didn't know about all those outdoor things. You know, no one ever took me fishing, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. I just never experienced it. So I think for our, uh, you know, purposes for Come Alive Outside, we really want to have people sh share with families, here are some ideas you can do right in your yard. You know, here are some ideas you can do right close by, you know, that kind of thing. And so helping them to under really understand what's available. Right. Yeah, and I think that, that it's just so important, right, to being outdoors is not having to go to the national park. You can do it in your backyard. You could do it with a jar. You could do it in these, these simple steps. You could do it in your local park. Um, so I think that's really great to you know, find the outdoors where you're at. And that is a big barrier too, is you know, outdoors as, as we think of it seems really expensive, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, and Norm, can you speak to, to your, um, the barriers that you recognize and the work that you do and in your personal experience? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, I sat down and I actually wrote out a list of all of the things and, and Myrna and Mira have, have done a fabulous job of sort of stealing all of my content at this point. <laughs> Most of the things that we've already listed have, have sort of particular impacts on different communities, right? There's, there's a particular impact for, you know, sort of uh, lower financial status communities. There's a particular inter or particular impact on um, folks with disabilities. They're, they're all the same sort of barriers. There's money, there's access to appropriate equipment, there's sort of know-how, um, there's awareness of opportunities. Um, in, in my particular world, working with the folks that I work with, um, there's actual physical barriers too that we have to address um, around, you know, are trails appropriate, are buildings accessible, are surfaces appropriate, um, are things like colors and noise appropriate for particular participants? Um, you know, on, on our poll, we had transportation. That's a particular interest for folks with mobility impairments. Um, you know, I think also that there is, there's a big piece around sort of, and, and I think Myrna mentioned it, it's sort of around this sense of um, sort of unreasonable fears and expectations, right? In, in both ends of that spectrum. One that it only counts if I'm if I'm climbing Everest, and on the other of like you know the wolves are going to get me. Like no, ne neither one of those is true. Like you know you you're in a lot more danger riding the car to get there than you are from anything else. Um, the the bigger piece for me though is that all of these things are systemic, right? They are all connected. It's not just that we can look at money as the solution to barriers. It's not just that we can go around and change the width of trails and that we're taking care of a barrier. It's that all of these things are interconnected and that to be really successful in breaking down barriers and providing true equal access, we have to, we have to address the system, not just the individual components of it. Right. I'd love to have you know the panelists elaborate on that. What does that look like, Norm? and Myrna and Myra, if you could speak to that. Um, I will, uh, so when I was a kid, so I got to go to camp. I got to go to sleepaway camp for four weeks and it was a public private partnership um, in which you know, there were sliding scale fees for families as they were able to afford or not afford going to this spectacular camp where I learned to swim, I learned to hike, you know, I learned to catch one fish. That's the only fish I've ever caught in my life uh, <laughs> when I was eight years old. And then we had to throw it back in and I was really upset. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so I think that's really, really uh, important as far as uh, erasing those barriers. Um, and, and, and Norm, I love that you said uh, that these are systemic issues because I'm putting on my uh, diversity trainer hat. <laughs> you know, if you think about the intersection of identities, you know, it's not just race, but, uh, or ethnicity, there's age, there's your, you know, where you live. Um, do you live in an urban area, exurban, rural, suburban? Um, uh, it is uh, it is socioeconomic. It's age. 
It is your, uh, your physical ability, your cognitive ability. Um, you know, like we, I, and I also love as an educator that you mentioned, um, that you alluded to neurodiverse people. You know, do you have flashing lights? Do you, you know, what, is it color appropriate? Those things are so, so important to be thinking about, not, you know, not only in the outdoors, obviously, but in everything that we do in every arena that we exist. Um, uh, that said, I think, you know, introducing kids and at an early age, obviously, to uh, experiences outdoors. Um, I got to, as a teacher, um, I got to take sophomores in high school on backpacking trips. And we were in, in the, the North Georgia mountains and many of these kids had never even explored where they were born. <laughs> um, and so we, we got to see them grow and gain that confidence um, to gain social skills, to um, develop friendships with other, with other kids that they would never have, uh, and they would never have had in their own so social circles because they learned to live together. They learned to put up a tarp. They learned to sleep really close together. Obviously we wouldn't do that right now, but um, you know, under tarps, like with Copperhead snakes, you know, slithering around, um, and it and it it was this incredible experience. And now those kids seek out; they're not kids anymore; they're young adults. Uh, they they seek out opportunities to do those things. Maybe not hardcore backpacking, but hey, Miss Valerio, I'm in town. Do you want to go hiking? Um, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, and also role modeling for your own kids. I have a 17 year old, right? Um, who loves running and who deals with stress by going outside and playing basketball. And he, and he comes back and then he's super chatty. <laughs> which I, it's a gift. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, reintroducing recess and other things uh, as part of uh, curricula and, and schools. Um, if you have gear knowledge, if you have gear, if you have a car that you can take somebody with you to a park or somewhere that um, that's new for them, do it. Um, again, post COVID. <laughs> um, uh, if, uh, and, you know, I, I talked about public-private partnerships, um, giving money, you know, putting money where your mouth is, um, sliding skills, experiences, providing transportation. Um, and also like, I think land acknowledgements are a, a huge part of this because when you do a land acknowledgement, like right now, uh, if we're in Vermont, if you are in Vermont, uh, you are on Abenaki land, right? That acknowledges history you know, teaching history about these particular areas that we're in and, and how certain cultures were erased uh, and are dominated, getting rid of domineering language when we're talking about the outdoors, like conquering, smashing, <laughs> um, those things. I did say destroying barriers, uh, <laughs> but I'm just gonna leave that there for destroying barriers because I wasn't talking about destroying, you know, I'm gonna destroy this trail. Um, so, um, and then also like, I think perhaps what, there are two things that are really, really important. Um, hiring and training, uh, people of color and, and or and people of um, disenfranchised communities to be leaders in the outdoors. Um, you know, when I see someone that looks like me or that may have some sort of shared experience, I am, uh, you know, represented in marketing, represented, you know, in the staff, you know, when I go to a, a park and there's a park ranger that's black or that's Latinx, you know, I, I breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> Um, because I know that that person probably will not marginalize me as I am uh, recreating in the outdoors. Okay, so that's very important. Um, and then, you know, making sure your signage and advertising and marketing is, uh, is you know, rep represents the community that you're in, you know, and all the possible communities that can participate in, in those activities. Any other panelists would you like to, to add to how you feel we can re continue to reduce barriers? Norm? Yeah, I mean, I, so one of the things, you know, certainly, certainly my role and Vermont Adaptive's role in, in community in Vermont is to do that very thing, right? And so we're an organization that sort of addresses some of those barriers directly, particularly for people with disabilities. Um, you know, I think, I think another piece in all of this is, <sighs> There, there's an element of, of um, we have to sort of redefine what success, what participation, what 
skill in some of these areas is. Um, so, you know, I can, I can give the example of somebody with a disability who sits down to ski. Um, there, there's sort of a cultural perception of like, oh, that, like, that's, that's an impairment, right? That, that's, that's less than, that is, that is not as good as. Um, if we can shift some of our focus away from the fact that there's something different happening, that their method of accessing our sport or whatever is a little bit different and start looking at what are they actually accomplishing? Is their ski performing the way that we want it to ski? Are they skiing with style and grace and, and skill? We start to redefine some of those barriers, right? We start to look at things a little bit differently around, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe that bucket in particular setup isn't as different as the fact that that person is skiing at a much higher level than I am, or that person is riding at a much higher level than I am, or, or biking or fishing or pick your pick, whatever. Um, just, just redefining what we consider sort of the, the cultural norm, right? Those sort of normative pieces around what, what someone who participates in the outdoors looks like and start to focus on their, their skill and their performance in that environment starts to change a bunch of these things. Definitely. And I love, you know, what Myrna, what you said about, you know, seeing people that look like you when you go to these outdoor environments. And I think that's the same thing, you know, Norm, seeing, you know, people of all abilities, just, it's not, you know, that this is someone with a disability skiing. It's just, this is a skier. Like, you know, it's not about, you know, identifying, you know, we are different, you know, we appreciate the differences, but, you know, as a, as a plus size hiker, I like seeing other fat hikers out there. It makes me feel welcome. It makes me feel included. And it makes me feel like I can go out there and keep doing it. And, you know, I think that is uh, representation is a big barrier. Um, and I think that's part of that big social inclusion thing that you're talking about too. It's really important stuff. And Myra, what can you add in your work about reduction of barriers to the outdoors? Destroying barriers. I like that, Myrna. <laughs> Yeah, it's all in that language, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I think um, you know with our programs, we like the kids passport. You know, we really want to make sure that families can learn. Hey, I can go out and do this. You know, I can go out and make my own adventure in my yard in my neighborhood. It it's not a big thing that I have to come up with that gets me outside and you know we have incentives you know if you you know participate in this program and you you do so many activities you get a prize you know you can collect your prize so just trying to help people to you know understand that they can get out we have that make your own adventure section in our passports and it talks about uh it gives examples like you know just um you know take a walk in the woods and do a nature sound scavenger hunt you know keep track of all the nature sounds that you hear build a snow fort take a walk in the full moon you know these are just some things that we suggest people do in our little passports and we make it very hyper local meaning that like we give a list of parks that people can access very easily and community activities that they can go to just by walking downtown, you know, where they close where they live. We talk about the fact that they can, you know, get snowshoes for free at the library, you know, go try it, you know, and uh, just take it walk in your neighborhood if you want to, or, you know, try a park that's close by. And we also talk about events that are free, such as um, the snow days that the Blue Cross Blue Shield puts on. It's free and you can learn about all these different activities that you can do. So I know Megan was going to talk a little bit about more about snow days. Yeah, Megan, can you chime in? Sure, thank you. Thanks so much for the chance to and I just want to acknowledge and sort of developing this array of events that we offer to try, that that attempt to sort of address some of these barriers, make all of the activities accessible. We have done it through the amazing participation of many of the faces I'm seeing out there, our community advisory boards, and then partnerships with folks like Come Alive Outside. So we're thrilled to have our event in uh, your passport. But, um, you know, in thinking of the stories, the examples of, of success with this programming, um, one comes to mind about a family, a, a teacher, I believe she's a paraeducator, um, I don't actually know in, in where in the state, but um, attend our snow days event and with her family, you know, it was cost prohibitive to go try cross country skiing. She brought her whole family. 
they did it. And then they went to a ski swap. They've had such a great time. They went to a ski swap and got cheap cross country skis. Now their family goes to our snow days every year. So that's the piece that I think connects to some of what you all are sharing about this idea of social connection and creating safe, welcoming spaces. You know, I think this now becomes a tradition for that family. And again, it becomes sort of part of life, not that you're participating in something because you're competing to be the best at this. You're just doing it in a way that builds it into a, a sort of regular part of your life. So we're we're excited to continue offering that. And if you if you go to our website, you can see it's accessible to everyone. You don't have to be a Blue Cross member. They're all free events and we do them seasonally. So we have snow days, mountain days, hike, bike and paddle and apple days and literally hundreds of people participate. And, and actually even more now that we're able to take stuff virtual. So we're sort of adapting this programming. And I think a lot of those adaptions are gonna stay because it's allowed us to give access across the board. You know, and I think early days, you know, some of our snow days, like we've had Vermont Adaptive there at snow days to help address those issues and let folks know, look, this is out there. There are organizations that can help um, you do this. Uh, so it's just inspiring to, to hear from you all and, and uh, thank you. And hopefully I'll be able to see folks face to face at snow days in the future. Thanks. And I think, you know, we, we keep coming back to this uh, topic about making people sure that people are aware or have the knowledge of it. And so how can we do that collectively, even if it's not something that, you know, is something that our own company or um, you know, interest or organizations doing, how can we share the information that's happening in the, the wider community of opportunities for folks? And I think, uh, you know, we're starting to do that a lot more in the nonprofit areas here, um, you know, in Rutland, but how do we make that broader? Because, you know, I've learned about a few things on this on this call that I didn't know existed. Apple days, what? That sounds great. <laughs> so, you know, how do we make sure that we're, we're sharing the information for everyone? Um, so we touched about on the, um, briefly touched about the scientific aspects of mental health benefits of getting youth outdoors, but I'd love to hear from our panelists about personal experiences that they've had with mental health and the benefits um, while getting outdoors. So uh, Myrna, do you mind starting with that one? Yeah. Um... I'll tell you a story about two days ago, I had to go to New York for a funeral. And um, I, so I was really sad. I had to, then I had to get up super, super early. I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning uh, and drive back to Vermont. And so, and it took me around five and a half, six hours. And I had a full day of work ahead of me. And um, I, was so tired and I had to do a shoot. And so, you know, and the shoot happened to be outside. The minute I got outside on these snowy trails here in Montpelier, I was immediately energized. My mind was clear. I was still sad, but my mind was clear. Um, and, you know, my heart was full. I mean, and, and as you, as, as some folks alluded to the video that I put on, on my, Instagram uh, of me running in the snow, that was that day. And, uh, and then I was able to come back, finish my work day. I was still tired by the end, but I definitely had mental clarity where, you know, I wasn't <laughs> slurring my words because I was so tired. Um, and just, you know, like, I wish everybody could experience that. I know I said that at the beginning, but, but that's what, what it did for me. Like, it gave me like, in terms of like, the cognitive ability to continue my day, the, the mental clarity, the energy, because I moved my body and got my blood moving. I'd been, I'd been in a car um, for a long time brooding. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so that's, I mean, that's for me, that's I, every time I go outside, there's, there's that experience. I always feel better. Um, even when I've had a difficult time outside, I, I never feel worse. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's a, a major thing for me that just kind of replicates itself um, day after day. And also, I, I noticed that my friend Lori is on this call. Lori is one of the backpacking instructors that I used to work with uh, when I was a teacher, and she is phenomenal, phenomenal. So, Welcome hi, Lori. Lori. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it so funny? 
fun to see friends pop up on these. <laughs> yes. I'm feeling very emotional now. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I think you know it's uh there's just something so simply magical about connecting to the outdoors and how it can change the way that your your mood is feeling, and uh, you know I I also feel like you know there are days when when I get maybe a little overwhelmed with work and I don't go outdoors and it's the opposite feel like I feel irritable I feel depressed and I just need to go outside and get a little mother nature. Um, Myra, can you speak to some of the experiences that you've had with mental health? Yeah, I think that the most telling experience I had was just recently with uh, Park RX is one of the programs that we do. And originally that is where providers prescribe for pa their patients to get outside and be active. And so we ran another cohort this fall, which ended in November. And part of the program is that I would call them up on a bi-weekly basis, say, how you doing? You know, they were tracking their activity. They set their goal at the beginning of the 12 weeks. But I think that just them sharing and uh, about their, their experience and over and over again, they said, several of them said, I just really needed this. I needed to be outside, especially during COVID. I'm so afraid. You know, many of them were afraid with COVID. They were afraid to go anywhere, but they they looked at the trail map and took a, a walk, you know, and they got out there. And one lady just shared that, you know, I this was just like the saving thing for me right now. I needed this to happen in my life right now. So I think that being outside helps people just to feel a sense of peace, like Myrna said, just to, brings a different demeanor to you right away. We, we also survey our participants and we ask that question, you know, uh, exactly. Um, and we found that over 90% of the participants have stated that the program had a positive impact on their mental well being. And so we can see it, we can hear it in their voices, we can uh, see it in their stories. So I think it's, it, it, I mean, you have the statistics, but it's the stories that really tell you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, Myra. And I uh, talked to Karen King today. Karen King is one of our, uh, she was a ParkRx participant who then has also in our mile day programs and everything that we do. And she was telling me today that she was feeling like a self-identified hiker today, which I thought was such a great thing. And, you know, she's just come so far in her own mental health and physical journey with this program. So um, it's just wonderful to, to see the progression that people can have and the happiness in their lives. Parker X is very awesome. <laughs> um, and Norm, can you speak to some of the mental health benefits you've seen in the work that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that comes to mind just listening to while other folks are talking is that one of the distinctions that we make as an organization and sort of in the, the adaptive industry as a whole is the difference between therapeutic and therapy. And the sense that by and large, we don't, we don't do therapy. We're not looking for clinical outcomes from our interventions. But we recognize, as, as Myrna and Mira have very eloquently pointed out, that there are vast therapeutic benefits, right? And so I think, I think that's something for us all to sort of be aware of is that we may go into a lot of these experiences and into, into breaking down these barriers with the idea that we're going we're gonna to have some positive outcomes. It's not necessarily our job to decide what those outcomes are. We just kind of have that faith that they're going to happen. Um, in, in terms of a more sort of personal story, um, one, of the, one of the things that I'm most closely attached to in my own identity as an outdoorsman is um, I have been the, the coach of one of our adaptive ski racing teams for the last 15 years. And many of the athletes on that team have been on that team for that for those 15 years so as a as a community we have we've grown together during that time and, and i've known them throughout their adolescence and now their young adulthood um what's what's really fascinating to me and and super important to me and sort of my own identity is how important that team and that experience has been to those to those racers, to those skiers. Um, we, we've got uh, athletes on that team who as, as kids were nonverbal and now are 
very verbal and and are social and and can sort of operate not only in our community but but sort of successfully interact in, in other communities and, and in foreign communities. Um, we've got athletes on that team who struggled with school and mental health issues as kids and are now in college and on their ski racing teams and on their own sailing teams. Um, we've got athletes from that team who, um, you know, kind of, kind of didn't engage with their community at all. They were sort of almost like sort of oppositional in some of their, in their way of interacting and now cannot keep them away. They, they self-identify as being a part of that team. They self-identify as being, as being a skier, as being a paddler. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's a really powerful thing. And I think that that sort of sense of long-term intervention and long-term benefit is, is a huge part of that. It's incredible. Yeah. And I mean, and there's just something about, you know, we talked about the science of it earlier, right? About being able to try new things, being able to have confidence and how that affects mental health. And I think it's really important that you talked about, you know, we're not providing therapy, we're providing, it's sort of like an extra toolkit, <laughs> an extra tool for the toolkit in embracing wellness and embracing mental health. And uh, very important that you point that out. Thank you, Norm, for sharing that. Um, so before we go to the question and answer period, I wanted to see if any of our panelists wanted to uh, elaborate on anything else that their co-panelists have said that really resonated with them. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, yeah, so uh, as you heard in my, in my bio, I was uh, a cross country coach and I, had, I was a cross country coach for a long time. And one of my jobs was in a very, very small all girls school that had a lot of um, uh, neurodiverse kids, uh, kids with, um, Speak, uh, communication difficulties, um, kids who had, had like non-specific language disorders. And, um, and so those are the kids that I got on my cross country team. We weren't competitive <laughs> uh, because they, you know, they maybe didn't have the coordination to play soccer or basketball or volleyball, um, but they could, they could run because you can run any way your body moves, right? And, um, and so they would come on my team and I would teach them to run as a lifestyle. And a lot of these kids, you know, would be this very silent kids in class. They would um, be the very awkward kids, um, you know, who didn't necessarily, maybe sometimes they were on the spectrum. And so they um, might not have been able to read social cues, but the minute they would get out and we would go out for a run, we'd go out for a mile run and we, I'd, I'd you know, it, it really was non-competitive because I was running with them and I'm slow. <laughs> Um, and, you know, it would turn into a social thing. It would turn into this thing where they, you know, by the end, they, I had them run nine miles and that was our, you know, our capstone project. And, and it took us a very long time to do it, but um, they would be so proud of themselves and that would awaken this new confidence. And also they would also, they would have friends now because a lot of these kids didn't have any friends. And they had this shared experience in the outdoors where they learned about themselves. They learned that, that they were strong when people had told them they weren't strong. They learned that they were smart and that they were actually coordinated because they could move their body rhythmically um, along a road and get somewhere. Um, they would learn these incredible social skills. They learned, um, you know, not that this was a panacea to, to everything, but, you know, they would learn to have conversations and the back and forth. Um, and it was incredible to watch. And then they turned, if they were in my class, they turned into different kids. They were now um, way more verbal than they were before because first of all, I was a trusted adult. I knew them outside of the class, the classroom um, and I allowed them to explore. And so like, I think if we can bring more of those types of experiences to all kids, um, the, 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 the connections that are created and that that confidence is so so important right now um and that the the need for them to go outside and and experience the outdoors because that's where they had those good experiences and they want to replicate that in their lives that's what we need um you know and then also the, you know the fact that and i love that the the concept of biophilia right where you know we are naturally inclined as human beings to be connected to nature because we are of nature we are nature right and to have to create more experiences where those kids 
uh, and, and adults <laughs> um, can experience those things um, on a regular basis will, will, um, will be hugely beneficial to, to our goal of, of destroying <laughs> these barriers. I love this, you know, shared experience and community is so important. You know, and I think that's one thing, you know, looking at the you three panelists that we have, you know, having the community of Come Alive Outside through its programs, through people repeating programs is so essential in adapting those behaviors of becoming more comfortable with the outdoors. Having Vermont Adaptive have that community, have that structure where people can go through those programs and have, you know, shared experience. And then also, you know, with, with you, Myrna, I mean, you're our influencer on here, but you are the leader of a community. I mean, that's how a lot of people have interacted with you, either through Fat Girl Running or through your uh, following on Instagram. It's being part of a club that you feel accepted in and that you feel empowered to go out. And so how do we do that for our kids? Because we, we see these. So how do we do that day to day? And how do we have trusted adults that can be the leaders of those communities? interesting to think about. <laughs> yeah. uh, Norm and Myra, do you have anything that you want to, to add to that you heard co-panelists say, or that is just on your the tip of your tongue that you feel you must express? <laughs> well, I, I think what you just said about youth, I, uh, I'm part of the Vermont Youth Project and have been going to those meetings and that idea of creating what they call third space, which I hadn't even didn't know what that term was, but just and that extra activity that happens outside of school and home that is positive for kids. And Rutland's working really hard to try to um, identify what kids need. You know, they're really interviewing the kids and gathering the data. And I think for us at Come Alive Outside, it's important that we're at that table and that we also figure out how we can, you know, provide resources for families to, in a positive way where these kids can, you know, we're creating third space experiences that really uh, help the kids to, you know, say, hey, you know, I didn't know I could do that, or I didn't know I had an interest in that, in being outside. Um, you know, I to share a short story, I was a naturalist and worked as an environmental educator outside of Cleveland, and I did a three-day program where the kids came three days in a row, it wasn't overnight. And these were inner city Cleveland kids. We're walking along a trail and, you know, we, we, I saw a bug and another kid saw a bug and they're like, oh, we got to squish that. You know, there's your, you know, smash it. And I, I quickly got down on my knee and said, oh my gosh, look at that. It's purple. You know, and I, and they all got down with me. And immediately after that, it was like, they wanted to show me everything in nature. So they went from, you know, an, a, a feeling of not really feeling safe in the woods or not really under, you know, aware of what's around them in the woods to this, I want to share, I want to share, oh, look what I found, look what I found. And nature became something different for them over the next three days. And so I think that's important that we create just those little experiences that help people make those little steps towards feeling comfortable and working towards finding their own identity in the outdoors. I love that. Finding that your own identity outdoors and little steps. Very important. Thank you. And thank you for sharing about, it's called third. Sorry, third space. Third space. Yeah. So Very cool concept. Vermont, Vermont After School is actually having a, a workshop at four today. Uh, so if you go to Vermont After School, you can, they have a, a workshop about for parents and co-communicating with kids. So and I see Jess just put a link down there. Jess, you're so good at like finding all these links and throwing them in the chat. It's fantastic. <laughs> Norm, did you have anything that you wanted to add before we go to Q&A? You know, I, the only thing that I was thinking about was sort of the, the responsibility of those of us that are sort of leaders in this world, right? Around providing good, good direction, good advice, and to be really sort of thoughtful and conscientious about the directions that we encourage people. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that there, there are a lot of spaces where a particular goal won't be achieved, right? So if, if our goal is social inclusion, then putting somebody into an environment where it's a team sport, where their performance is not likely to, to sort of be on par with the rest of the team, that social inclusion piece is not likely to happen. 
um, right? There's going to be this sense of like, okay, we're physically inclusive, but we're not sort of performance inclusive or socially inclusive. And so it, it ties into this sense of being welcoming. It ties into this sense of, of you know, sort of what are, the, what are the benefits, but just having that sense of sort of what, what are we hoping for here? Is, is somebody really sort of intrinsically motivated or are we trying to put them in an environment where they're going to be successful and then sort of sculpting that environment a little bit so that they reach that goal, I think is really, I think that's important for those of us that are in positions to help do that. Definitely. I think we should have a whole call on social inclusion. I think that should be the follow-up because I mean, we could spend hours on this and it's so important because like you said, you could throw as much money at things in the world, but unless there's social inclusion, then nothing's going to change. So uh, can I add to that really quickly? Of course. Um, I think that uh, changing our paradigm of outdoor education is also very, very important. I love what, what Myra talked about um, as far as just like, just shifting the conversation a little bit differently as far as like smashing bugs. Oh, you know, look at the bug. Wow, it's purple. Oh my goodness, that's so cool. And then that created an immediate change. I think right now, and I, it is changing a little bit, um, you know, the outdoor ed used to be, you know, we're going to present you with this huge, unsurmountable or insurmountable, is that the word? <laughs> um, uh, challenge. And, um, and if, and if you can't do it, then, you know, they either, either don't deal with it <laughs> or they just go on to the next thing and then you feel like you're not successful, right? And so I think a, a, a greater idea is to, um, to make sure that people are having a good time. Um, National Black Skiers uh, Association or, or program, what they do- Brotherhood. Is, uh, Brotherhood, you know, so they introduce people to skiing and they ski for about an hour. They have, they have, a, um, they, they have a lesson Okay, and, and they don't ever go past the point where it becomes uh, not enjoyable. And then after their lesson, they're like, let's head, to, let's head apre ski, let's go have a beer, let's, and, and that's it. And so they're left with this incredible experience. I, I have definitely been, um, you know, at, uh, I've definitely had experiences where, you know, I've been in school and, um, and then that's my son in the back <laughs> who doesn't want to walk to school in the snow. <laughs> um, but where, you know, there's like this wall that we have to climb. I wrote about it in my book actually. Um, and, uh, and it was very difficult and I couldn't do it. And so like, here I was the entire rest of the day, everybody else could do it, but I couldn't because I didn't have the upper body strength to do it. And I felt awful and no, none of the, the, the instruct, instructors came to me and said, hey, you know, let's, you know, let's debrief or, or let's, you know, maybe, maybe we'll try it a different way. Maybe we'll help you, maybe nothing. And so I think that paradigm needs to shift. Uh, we do need to focus on creating successful experiences and enjoyable experiences for, for kids in the outdoors. I love that. Just like the successful experience, because a lot of times when we, we shame people, right? We shame kids if you can't do it, the performance, it's definitely key. Awesome. Well, let's, um, we have 12 minutes left. So let's open this up. Jessica, can you grab a question or two that has come in? I see that we have uh, like a hundred comments. So I'm sure there's a bunch of questions. So we'll see how many we can get through. <laughs> um, there has just been really a ton of great conversation and connection. So I really foresee this moving somewhere um, forward. And I think one of the big discussions that came up that you guys were talking about when really it's just becoming this is built into our culture, into our environment of being outdoors was with the schools and a lot of people noting how the one benefit or positive impact of COVID was the schools were forced to get the children outside more often, more frequently. We had someone share that the teachers are even like, let's keep this, how can we keep this? So I think that's a great question as we know, you know, it starts a lot in the schools. Um, so how can we make that impact and how can we share our positive experience with it, the children's positive experience, the schools to really make that impact as something that can stick with the curriculum and all, you know, I know they have so many roles and structures they have to follow, but where can we take it from there to really keep this um, embracement of getting outdoors going? Get on your school boards. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, if you want to affect involved. change, exactly. If you want to affect change, you know, you have to do it at that local level where it's really going to make a difference. You know, if you, you know, believe that, you know, we should keep 
the outdoor experiences in schools, um, you have to have access to those people that make those decisions. And uh, being on school boards or being a very active parent, et cetera, um, uh, is is really key, I think. Uh, you know, both in the public sector and the private sector. I've I've only worked in the private sector, and don't you know these parents? <laughs> they're very insistent, <laughs> and they're very entitled. And I wish that that public school parents felt more entitled to participate in the governance of their schools. Great. Anything to add, Norma Myra? No, just, just that I think that it's a community-wide discussion too, that, that what you need is involvement from folks that don't have kids in the schools, right? That, that as you're starting to talk about school budgets and, and school boards, that it, it's, you're impacting the entire community. And so getting buy-in from that entire community becomes an important part of that. Great point. I agree with that. I think that it really has to do with the uh, the, the teachers and the principals and the school board looking at the, the benefits of what they've learned this year, you know, and saying, hey, you know, our kids were happy being outside. Let's do it more. Awesome. Thank you. Lots of comments too about getting outside where it's not a sport or a structured activity. You're just outside. And one question came with what are some good low barrier activities to get kids of all abilities exposed to the outdoors? Oh, good question. I feel like you can all answer that one. Very perfect. So <laughs> our kids' passport has all kinds of fun activities that are not sports related. You know, they're like, like I said, take a, a walk in the woods and do a nature sound scavenger hunt or, um, you know, build a snow fort in your yard or um, uh, make sugar on snow, you know, you know, bring in the snow and, and try that. So there's lots of activities or just explore your park and journal what you see. Sit down, like Arwen said when she was a kid, sit down and journal what you've observed or draw pictures of, of something that you've seen, you know. So our, our kids' passport is just full of activities that help kids discover the outdoors without it being sports related. Our, uh, and, and Barry, we, we, I don't live in Barry. Um, <laughs> they have uh, at the Millstone Trails uh, during the like hol holiday, no Halloween season. They had a storybook walk. It was like a like a horror or kids horror storybook walk on a trail, and it was about I don't know maybe a half a mile long. But that it was really cool. It went through some really spectacular parts of the park, and you know it wasn't this you know let's go on a hike. It was let's go read this, let's go do the storybook trail and see all the autumn colors, and then at the end maybe have some hot chocolate or or hot apple cider or something. Uh, and that's a really cool way. I used to do that with my own cousins. I, um, in, when I lived in the Bronx, I lived across the street from Van Cortlandt Park, and I would bring them up from Brooklyn uh, and do this, uh, all of the Halloween activities that they would have on, on the, um, on the trails in the back, you know, they would be, we'd be hiking, but they didn't know they were hiking. They were there for the, um, the horror thing <laughs> for, you know, zombies jumping out at them, but it was a hike and it was really cool. Sounds like so much fun. <laughs> And no, that, that you said that we, I, I have on the floor right now a book I'm cutting up for a story walk that we're going to put in Pine Hill Park. So it, I'm trying to get it all together so we can, we're, we'll have, there were three story walks in, our, or four story walks in our passport this all around Rutland County. So that's a great way. And Norm, did you have something you wanted to add? I, yeah, I mean, I think these are all great ideas. I think um, one of the things to, to remember in any of these sorts of things is when you're looking for something to do, especially with kids, ask the kid, like ask the kid what they want to do and then figure out how to make that happen. Um, you know, it's all well and good for us to say, oh, we're going to do this, but by, by giving choice, by giving engagement, by giving involvement, we're, we're really sort of putting, putting kids and, and putting adults of, of whatever uh, group in charge of that, right? We're giving them ownership of that experience. And I think that's that's an important part of any of this. Yeah. And I'd also just add to this that, you know, imagination is free, right? <laughs> so I think, you know, it's not always about having the right gear or the right equipment to do an outdoor sport. Sometimes it's just about how do we ignite the imagination for kids to have unstructured play? 
and you know that's something that is you know accessible to all we could provide tools on that too myra is a whiz at magical creative thinking <laughs> uh, any other questions jessica that have come in we have time for one more i think one more yeah okay so and these kind of go to together i would say people are asking for resources to share with um, their youth but also how to overcome that barrier for the technology obsessed kind of teenager uh, where you're having trouble to even draw their attention and get them off their device oh <laughs> i'll tell you what i did <laughs> <laughs> um so my my son you know goes out on his own but he also does have three screens in his room because he has a youtube channel that that he says is very cringy um <laughs> but um but uh when he was not sort of going out on his own i said look you can't be in here <laughs> and I, I i took my very parental very teacher-like stance and i said you can't be in here all day so we're gonna go out we're gonna go out to a trail for an hour um and i and i and i know that i have the privilege of having a car and ha living in montpelier and i could i have access to many many different trails and mountains and stuff and so i said we're gonna go out i'm gonna run you can do you can sit here um you can run um and he goes well i'm only gonna run i'm gonna run three miles one and a half miles out and back and then i'm gonna go back to the car <laughs> and i'm like great <laughs> and he was so mad about it but he got outside and i know and i know there's a lot of opposition you know teenagers he's 17 now um there's always opposition but we know we sometimes we do know what's best and sometimes we do um know that there's going to be a benefit to them being outside so uh and then he just started doing it on his own <laughs> um, because he knew that he could sort of do it on his own. He didn't have to go with mom, <laughs> but that he could go back to his screens afterwards. So there was an incentive there and a bribe. <laughs> you do it works, right? <laughs> yeah, a little bit of external motivation never, never hurts. <laughs> Norm, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, well, first I wanted to say hi to Erin, who is one of the people that asked that question. Um, she, she and I know each other. Um, so it's another one of those small world, welcome to Vermont moments. I, I think the, uh, the other piece in this or, or another piece in this is, um, you know, lean, lean into it, right? Like if, if the technology piece is what somebody's engaging with, cool, use that to your advantage. Um, find an app that like, like Marna was suggesting, right? Like put them on, on Strava or one of the running apps or find a, find a scavenger hunt app or give them, give them a list of different foliage to go take pictures of, or like give them, give them a way to engage the two things together and, and use that as a way to build the engagement with the, with the natural world piece. Love that. Myra, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I agree with Norm there, I, and we are working on an app for our passport, so that would make it, you know, uh, engaging in that way. But there's also uh, geocaching and other activities that are out there already that you can tap into, and kids can discover all kinds of fun things. Uh, even like a Pokemon Go and the Harry Potter one, like it takes you outdoors. You just look through your, you know, your screen, and you see a monster or some sort of magical thing on there. I mean, in the ideal world, yes, like, oh, we're all going to unplug and, and not have it. But like, we have to be realistic. So I think, yeah, how do we combine these? You know, what's the best practice for getting them more engaged in things that are connected to the outdoors? Great. Oh, someone has some other, uh, I see a lot of resources. We're going to send out a big list of resources after. So with this last minute, um, and probably go over a couple minutes, but it would be great if all of our panelists could just go around and if there's one thing uh, from today's session that you want the, the audience to take away with them, what would that be? I think it'd be more than one thing. <laughs> I'll start. Um, you know, I, I would say that the, the outdoors encompasses more than one kind of outdoors. Um, and 
to acknowledge everyone's experience and their own ex their own sort of expertise. Like I said in the beginning, whether it's a you know the farming community, whether it's migrant farm workers, whether it's you know people who do like hike and trail run, acknowledging all of those experiences as the real outdoors um, is a huge step in in um, destroying barriers. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Norma, Myra, anything you want to leave folks with? I think just as COVID ends, it will end. I think it, hearing people's stories about how the outdoors helped them through this time, you know, and capturing those stories and having, you know, uh, group things together where people can talk and share and be outdoors together. I think those are the key things that we need to focus on when this is over. Hey, thank you. Norm? I, I think just be welcoming, right? Be open to, to seeing people that are different than you um, out, out in these environments. And and just be aware, I, I, you know, as Myrna was saying, that that their experience and yours are not the same, right? And so, being open to everybody's experience and and how positive that can be, is is a is a huge part of that piece of just having people feel like they're welcome and and able to participate and not being judged or or whatever when when they're out and and sort of sharing these outdoor spaces with us. Awesome, thank you. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for uh, such a meaningful and uh, I don't know, I've had a blast during this discussion today. And thank you for Blue Cross Blue Shields Ch Caring for Children Foundation for, for hosting this. Um, Jess, did you have any final words you wanted to say on your end before we close this out? Thank you all for your time, Arwen. That was beautiful facilitation. Myra, Norm, and Marna, thank you for your knowledge and sharing that with us all. Um, and as Norm said too, when you're out there hiking, skiing, whatever it may be, say hello and smile um, because that just might encourage that person to get outside the next day. And we'll be following up with a survey to get your feedback. I also shared the link to look for our future gathering. So have a wonderful day, everybody. Hey, bye-bye. <laughs>